Good morning, everyone. That was Joy and Lisa. Joy is actually literally my next door neighbor. They moved in not too long ago. If I walk out of my house and look two houses to the right, I see her and Daniel and their kids. And we've had a great time getting to know them. And it was actually my wife that brokered this deal to have them today. And I hope you enjoyed that. That was energetic and amazing. And I loved it. Um, you know, while I was preparing this sermon today, I was thinking about uh, all the life that's in my backyard, especially as it's been raining. It's amazing how much more rain uh, will spruce up your garden and your, your, uh, your grass than just watering it every day, even twice. I was watering it every day twice. And as I began to think about that very thing, I realized that um, there's something really special and profound about life. There's a story that C.S. Lewis wrote where I think it's the magician's nephew or something like that. And um, the lion, which represents God or Jesus, uh, sings into uh, being a, a new creation. He actually sings a planet into life. And the life is vibrating with that power in that planet so much that when one of the kids plants a little toffee in the ground, it turns into a toffee tree. And I thought to myself, you know, seeds are not that much different. If uh, seeds, when got planted in the ground, did nothing, then that's what science would observe. But instead, what science observes when a seed gets planted in the ground, if it's uh, soil that that uh, seed can be nourished by, and if you water, it actually turns into a plant. There's something amazing about life. And as I began to think about that very thing, uh, I remembered some of the science that I learned in my biology classes. And I'm no scientist or biologist, but Believe it or not, every one of us functions with a significant amount of biological knowledge. You can't even get by uh, in this world without knowing some of how our biology works. And one thing I remember learning about in, uh, in science class is that every good definition of life and what life is um, includes the idea of reproductivity. So if, if you have, let's say you were searching for life on another planet. Scientists have been searching for any signs of life or water or former life on Mars, if they were ever going to find something that they would actually define as being life, it would need to have the ability to reproduce, to make more life, to make more of the same. Think about it. It makes perfect logical sense. If it doesn't, then it's not life. It can't reproduce. It, we wouldn't even know about it because it'd already be gone. It wouldn't be there to study and to, to observe in that way. So life has to reproduce. There's much more to definitions of life than that, but life has to be able to reproduce. It's true in the plant kingdom. It's true in microorganisms. You know, and, and so you look at that and you use that. It's like, well, water is not alive. Water is not alive, but whales are. Uh, trees are alive, but rocks aren't. Birds are alive, but clouds aren't. Just use that one. Birds can reproduce. Clouds don't reproduce in, in, in that way biologically. Trees do. Rocks don't. Um, in fact, I was thinking about a feat that my brother accomplished. Uh, this is an amazing thing, and this is part of what caused me spinning into thinking about life before I was preparing my sermon. I don't know if you know what ultra marathoning is. It's basically just way more marathoning. So they, you know, it's like 26.2 miles that they run. Ultra marathoners will run 50 miles, 100 miles. And they usually do it in rugged terrain, not flat ground, but they do it in the Rockies. They do it in mountains, things like this. And they're always challenging each other. There's a community of ultramarathoners that are challenging each other to do something crazier than the next person. And one of those things is called Nolan's 14. My brother lives in, uh, in Colorado, and he's constantly hiking with his dogs and running and ultramarathoning in the, in the Rockies. And Nolan's 14 is um, 14, 14,000 foot peaks that, you, that are over, I think, about 50 miles or more, and you have to complete it in under 60 hours. And you can't really stop or sleep. It, uh, you will fail. In fact, before the whole thing happened this year in 2020, um, the, uh, I think the number of people that had completed was something like 11, I was reading. I'm not 100% sure that's true. And now it's more like in the 30s because people have more time on their hands. But my brother's one of the people that's com uh, completed it now. He finished, I think, in 51 hours, something like that. Well, anyway, you, you uh, lose and gain 44,000 feet of elevation. That's much higher than Mount Everest. Over, you know, 52 hours without any sleep. So you're not just running straight. You're climbing mountains and an ultra marathon. And I saw some of the pictures on Facebook and on his Instagram. And you're so high up, there isn't any life. It's just rocks. It's just this barren, moonscape-looking place. I mean, you can look down the valleys and see life. But the pictures where, where he was showing of the mountains, it's just rocks. And there's nothing there. You go to the moon, you go to Mars, there's just nothing there. And you look out in my backyard, and life is just thriving. 
and there's this reproductivity. It's a profound thing. It's a profound thing. And, you know, there's, there's something that we know about life, human life, that's a little different than all other life. Uh, let me make this point. Biological, purely biological definitions of life require biological reproduction. And if you were going to say, does that uh, pure biological definition also fit for humans? It actually does. Humans reproduce. Humans are alive. But it doesn't encompass enough of what it means to be a human. Let me give you an example. Um, if you saw a lion just like viciously tearing apart a little gazelle, would you be sad? I am. It's shocking. I'm sitting there usually like this. If you're not at all shocked, there's probably something wrong with you. Like I was looking at my boys, and which tell you which one, but there's one of them that's not shocked. And my thought, I don't think it's actually going to happen, is like you might become a serial killer, <laughs> you know, looking at a lion destroying this baby gazelle without any kind of feelings, you know. That was cool, daddy. Well, anyway, the fact of the matter is, you, even if you're shocked and really sad and upset by a lion destroying a little baby gazelle, you don't assign something morally evil to that lion. You don't think, that lion was so wrong. What a murderer. You know, you don't do that. With human beings, you do, though. The very existence of the fact that we evaluate human beings in terms of morality and don't evaluate animals in terms of morality creates categorical differences there. According to the Bible, we're made in the image of God, and that makes us moral in our character. We are able to discern something about what is right and what is wrong, and even if that discernment process is interrupted and broken, we still have categories of right and wrong. And when someone does something wrong, even in secular society, sometimes that's called a sin. In the Christian worldview that we call it a sin, it's something against God's design, something opposite of what he told us to do. And according to him, anything that he says is life, any, anything that he says don't do or do and you didn't is death. And it's that black and white. Do what God says, it's life, it makes sense. He's the creator and that's will be reproductive and don't do this or do this and if it's against God's will, it will be death. And so there are moral definitions to life when it comes to human beings. There's more to it than just biology. You know, think about how much 2020 has proven to us how much we care about human life. Think about it. Specifically our own is what I'm talking about here. People are willing to give up freedoms. I never thought they'd be willing to give up in America and across the globe to do what? To sustain their own lives. That is happening more than I've ever seen in my lifetime and I'm guessing more than you've seen in your lifetime where people are so focused on just sustaining their lives. That's how much lives matter to us. Our, our life, that's how much life matters to us in that sense. We don't want to lose it. And we'll give up a quality of living. We'll give up freedom. We'll give up all kinds of things because we don't want to lose our life because there's this fear of life. If you're no different than a tree, why are you afraid of death? Trees aren't scared. They don't experience fear in that way. Why are you afraid? Why do you have this desire to sustain your life? There's much more to you than there is to life that can be encompassed in a purely biological definition. And so if it is actually partly moral in nature, it's not that big of a step to say it's actually also spiritual in nature. There are things that we cannot understand about ourselves as human beings that if you're just using a biological lens. They're not found in the biological domain. A lot of what you can know about human beings is found in the biological domain. But there is a secret to life that is found only in the spiritual domain. And the exciting thing is, we're gonna discuss that secret as taught by Jesus, as revealed by Jesus, as unhidden by Jesus today in Luke 8. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them now to Luke 8. What I wanna tell you before we get into Luke 8, and we'll be in chapter 8, verse 1 through 15, is that, this is, this is I'm something I've been so excited about to say and for you to hear. It's that if you can actually understand what Jesus says here, not only will you no longer fit the purely biological definitions of human life, you won't even fit the more a full, in, a full uh, in all encompassing kind of definitions that include morality, and you won't just be able to understand some spiritual things, but the reality is that if you can understand, truly understand what's being said here today, that means that even though you die biologically, you will live forever in heaven with Jesus. There's a secret to life here 
that overrides all scientific, biological, moral, any other kinds of definitions of life to the point though, even though you die, you'll live again forever, never to die again. So if you understand what this is saying, that's a promise directly from Jesus, directly from God. If you can understand this, you ought to be rejoicing because although you die, you will live forever. I'm not exaggerating at all. Just follow along and you'll see the secret. It's, it's, it's kind of like an open secret. Jesus explains exactly what it means, but that doesn't mean you can understand it without his help. So look at verse one with me of chapter eight. And keep in mind this entire time that there's a secret in here. Normally I give you my main point right off the bat. The main point really happens in the last verse. And you, can't, you can go skip ahead and read the, the verse, but you have to have Jesus' whole explanation here to understand what this secret to life actually is. So here, verse 1 in chapter 8. Soon afterward, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. So he's in full gospel ministry swing here. He's full swing in gospel ministry. He's going around preaching and healing, and he's going to be doing this for the rest of Luke. And you know the twelve. I actually want to back up and read to you the names of the twelve. We had a whole sermon on, on them and who they were just in the past. In chapter 6, starting in verse 14, it's uh, Simon, whom he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, and James, and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, uh, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who is called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and then Judas Iscariot. Most, I mean, in religious circles, especially Christian circles, all of these men have now become world famous. But some of them have become world famous regardless. Almost everybody knows about the Apostle Peter and, and the big three, John, Peter, John, and James, and Judas, known for the wrong reasons. But these have become famous men. So when it says the 12, most likely people have an idea, even if you can't rattle off the names, oh, I know what he's talking about. It's the 12 guys he just spent his whole life with during his three-year ministry. But I want you to notice something in the very first two words. It says, soon afterward he went Okay, what was soon afterward? If you just back up to verses 36 through 50, my heading says the sinful woman forgiven. And what had happened here is a woman, a woman of the city, we don't know what her sins were. And people guess when they hear woman of the city what they are. I don't even want to guess in this case because I don't think it's fair to this woman. But the fact of the matter is she was a known sinner. So whatever she was doing was publicly known as really bad and people judged her for it. And she comes with an attitude of desperate need of forgiveness and Jesus forgives her. And one of the prideful Pharisees named Simon balks at that. What is he doing? If he knew who he was, if, she was, if he was truly a prophet, he wouldn't even let her touch him. And, and Jesus has this amazing lesson about uh, for those who have been forgiven much, love much. There's a degree of love that comes out of having been loved so much through forgiveness in Jesus. And the point was not that uh, Simon didn't have a lot of sin to be forgiven. It's, it's, it's that he didn't think so, and so he doesn't love very much. And so the whole point of this last story was about a woman forgiven. And so it would be easy enough to kind of assume, well, it was just in your mind, picture just 12 guys with Jesus, and that's the only people around him. But Luke over and over and over again makes the point that it was a mixed crowd. There were women with him. In fact, from the very beginning of the gospel, he, ha he highlights Mary, the mother of Jesus. He highlights Elizabeth. He highlights Anna, the prophetess. He highlights Peter's mom being healed. He highlights the widow of Nain, and her son being resurrected from the dead. Over and over again, more than any other gospel, Luke highlights women involved in some way in Jesus' ministry. And it's not any different right here. And you have to think, why is he highlighting this over and over and over again? Let me read verse 2. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. He goes out of his way to say how many women were with him, and he names a couple of them and actually shows how Jesus had ministered to them. Right, let's just take uh, the first one here, Mary Magdalene. By the way, there is no evidence that, that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. That is just something that people kind of just decided that must have been. In fact, they think maybe this woman that in, uh, we just talked about, the woman of the city, you know, she was probably a prostitute. That's why people know. Maybe, maybe not, but we don't know. 
And it happens so easily that we begin to sort of think we know other people's sin, and then we think we know in, in Scripture, oh yeah, it must have said that, because where would they have gotten it from? Well, it's just totally superimposed on her. We don't know. What we do know is that she was harassed, oppressed, and enslaved by seven demons. She was possessed, and not just by one demon. And if you know anything about possession, I don't mean by experience. Maybe you actually know something by experience, but I'm talking strictly biblically from the Gospels. Possession is horrific. Demons cause people to hurt themselves. They give them suicidal ideas and not just, hey, you know, kill yourself in a nice way. Go throw yourself in the fire. Demonic oppression is is the worst. It's horrible. It takes over your will and your strength and your ability. It causes disease. It causes moral degradation within yourself. It, it, it causes you to do and think things that are obscene and perverse and wicked, and you're not fully in control anymore. You are possessed. And nobody has the power to do anything about it at that time. You know, when Jesus commands demons to leave, everybody's shocked that he's able to do that. You reverse engineer that people are shocked by him casting out demons. It means no one's been doing that. So no one's been here to help Mary except for Jesus. And many of these other women too were healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Infirmities could mean any number of things, any kind of physical ailment, some kind of weakness, something that's actually diminishing their life. Back to that life theme. And Jesus saved them from that. Can you imagine how much these women loved Jesus? Can you imagine how much they loved him? Did you know that at that time for a rabbi to have women as disciples was unheard of? It wouldn't happen. Religious leaders at that time had a very low view of women and an even lower view of women in ministry. But Jesus didn't. Jesus did not have a low view of women. Let's read on to see what kind of uh, view Jesus had of women. And any kind of women, of any kind of socioeconomic status. Look at verse 3. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household, uh, Herod's household manager. Herod's the king at the time. He likely lived in his palace with him. Joanna's husband is the household manager, a ranking official within Herod's palace. So that means Joanna was a very wealthy woman. So whether someone was poor and harassed or whether they were just rich and actually a servant to the king, there were women of any kind of culture and background following Jesus. We don't know mu that much about Susanna. She's named here. And we're assuming that the people at the time that uh, Luke wrote this knew exactly who Susanna was. But it also says, and many others. And they provided for them out of their means, meaning the, the ministry that Jesus was doing with the 12 required financial support. I didn't have any kind of offering talk today because we're remote and there isn't an offering, but I thought let's wait till we get to this point where we find out that these women were providing for Jesus' ministry out of their own means, providing financially, providing food, providing whatever they could that Jesus and the disciples and any other people that were ministering along with them did. You see... Jesus not only doesn't have a low view of women, he has a loving view of women. It's an unloving view to have a low view of women. It's an unloving thing to think that they can't participate in ministry. And it might seem like, well, in these days that this is an obvious statement, but women were disciples of Jesus too. They were disciples of Jesus too. I think we forget it too quickly and, and ministry becomes focused in a way, especially discipleship-oriented. And, and what I mean by discipleship-oriented ministry is a mentor-style discipleship where a lot of focus uh, in small groups and one-on-one -on -one for the development of another person where someone takes some spiritual responsibility for the development of another person for a time. That kind of development is too easily focused on men because we too easily think uh, well, it was just about men and, and their discipleship, and it wasn't. Jesus had women as disciples, and he loved them, and they loved him, and they were generous. They were generous. Whenever a ministry becomes all, of, all, all about money, that is always a bad thing. But the fact of the matter is that if you're saved by Jesus, and you recognize, like whoever this woman was, that you were forgiven of a lot, you're going to love a lot. And when you know the greatest person, who, the greatest lover of all people, people is actually Jesus, and so you got to trust him. He's the one that has the power to save you. That's how much he loves you. He's going to lay his life down for you. At this time, they don't even know that. They've just been saved of things no one else could save them from. When you realize what Jesus has done for you in his ministry, it is a natural and normal thing for you to desire to support that, to support that financially. And so it's a good thing when a church is doing well in terms of finances, and we are, 
And I think that's strong evidence of health in our body. We have a loving view at Boone's Ferry Community Church of women as well. I don't make too much of a point of them, of them giving, but as we know from Scripture, giving is not something you do under compulsion. It's not so much, oh, I have to give. And it's also not something that you do begrudgingly, like, well, I guess I'll give, but I don't, I don't really want to. If it's that, then there's something that you've misunderstood and haven't quite grasped yet about the gospel. The most valuable thing that exists in the world, the life of Jesus Christ was given for you. That is the gospel. And so when you realize how much you were forgiven and that he had to die for you, it's, yes, it is a supernatural response, but it's a supernatural natural response for you to want to support him with everything you have, for, for him to be able to build his church and for the gospel to spread more across the earth. And these women had been saved in that way, and so they were giving of themselves time, talent, and treasure to support his ministry. And that is a valuable thing to be offering to, to Jesus in ministry. It's just one example of the valuable thing that many women were offering Jesus in participating with his gospel ministry. Now you might think, well, what does this have to do with the parable? What does this have to do with any kind of secret of life? The first thing that I just want to say is that the secret of life is not just for men or just for women. It's for both. The people that were hearing what Jesus is about to say in this parable were a mixed crowd. They were not just the 12 and not just a large group of men, but a mixed crowd. Men, women, and children, if you take into consideration that he fed children in the uh, parable or in the, in the feeding of the 5,000. So he's got this mixed crowd. He's got this mixed crowd. So this secret to life uh, is not dependent on your gender. The secret of life and understanding this secret to life that he's about to tell us and reveal to us, hopefully, is not based on who you are in terms of your wealth, who you are in terms of your gender, who you are at all, really. It's based on who Jesus is. And that's really good news. Because there are times where our culture and traditions begin to favor one type of person over another in terms of uh, intelligence. And I don't mean intelligence like how intelligent they are, but like giving people knowledge, putting them on the inside circle of understanding things. It just happens so quickly that we do this thing where we make one group more important than the other. And, and Jesus shows here very clearly that's not the case. That was not his discipleship. And that would have been very countercultural at the time. At the time, like I said, low view of women and especially low view of women in ministry. And yet Jesus had a loving view of women and a loving view of women in ministry. And these secrets were explained to them as well. They were disciples. So let's move on and actually find out this hidden secret. And in verse 4 and 8, it's still hidden, but it gets begun to be explained starting in verse 9. Here's the parable. And before I even get into this parable, I want you to realize that my favorite definition, I didn't make it up, not sure who did, my favorite definition of a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. An earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The earthly story can be understand, in this case, literally just in the biological domain. What he says here, we can observe happening. We can observe happening in our world. Even today, you know that these things actually happen that he talks about biologically when it comes to planting and harvesting. But there's something more here, something that we'd have no idea what it was if Jesus didn't explain it. And that's the heavenly meaning. Unless Jesus explained it, we've not been to heaven. He was in heaven ever since, ever since. He came from heaven to earth and only spent a time on earth, but was had always been there with God in perfect communion. He knows the heavenly secrets. He knows them all, and he can explain them. And if you understand them, he'll say, if you can actually understand what this is, then you know the secret of the kingdom of God. So let's read the part, the earthly story, where that heavenly meaning is still hidden. Verse 4. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell on good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What a strange statement if you're just hearing this for the first time. Everybody has ears. 
How couldn't they hear? Well, maybe there were some, some deaf people. Is that what he's talking about? He wants deaf people to hear here too? What does he mean, who, who has ears, let him hear? And I want to challenge you, if you've been around Christian circles for a while, don't actually forget verse 9 through 15, but pretend you hadn't heard it. Try to pretend you've never heard the explanation. You would have no idea what he's talking about in verse 4 through 8 in terms of its heavenly meaning, in terms of its deeper spiritual meaning. If you've ever been around planting and harvesting time, or if you'd lived at that time and almost all the economy, especially on the Israelite side, was an agricultural economy, you would have actually witnessed what he's talking about. So a sower goes out and there were these footpaths through the field and he's sowing and some falls on the path and the path is trampled, it's not tilled and it's not gonna get watered either. And birds, you know, just imagine them in a tree, see a feast right in front of themselves. And, and in a sense, in this case, it's not even a tragedy in just the biological side of it because those seeds, ah, that's going to happen and they're gone. It says the sower went out to, see, to sow his seed and some sowed fell among the path and it was trampled underfoot. People were walking on it. There's just, it can't take root and the birds of the air devour it. <coughs> okay, it's just a statement of fact. An agricultural, biological statement of fact. But it means nothing without an explanation. Same thing with the next one. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. You know, with some shade and some uh, uh, rain, a seed could actually uh, maybe spring up to life in, in a rocky soil. But rocks don't hold that moisture. And so if there's a, a dry spell for a little bit, that, rock is, or that, that, uh, that seed is going to die. It's going to wither away even though it maybe grew for a little bit. And so the rocky soil too. And they'd maybe seen that. You know, there's some rocks over here and, uh, oh, that, that looks like wheat that's planted there. But then a couple days later, because it was hot, it's all withered. They would know exactly what he's talking about. But still, who knows what it means? Why is he telling this story? Is he trying to teach us how to be farmers? What's going on? And some fell among thorns and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. I actually understand this one from experience, not necessarily with wheat and thorns, but I planted um, tomatoes this year and they did really well. But I had the boys get involved and they were planting um, carrots, all kinds of different carrots in a little pot. And Judah, my youngest, I didn't realize this, but he's just kind of throwing them all over the place. And they got in the box with the tomatoes over on one side. And in that area... Um, and they wouldn't let me pull them out. I just wanted to pull them out so that the tomatoes have all the space to root. But what happened is a bunch of these carrots, which by the way is just literally a root. It's a root vegetable. So the root takes all of the energy uh, to grow in that plant. And so carrots probably, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm guessing carrots more than other plants are absorbing the nutrients of that soil. And right there where my tomato plants, one tomato plant grew one tomato. It was some kind of an heirloom yellow tomato and I got one off of it because of the competing roots in the soil. And it's the same thing here with these thorns. You plant wheat or whatever was being planted here among these thorns, and the thorns are going to choke it out. They're going to suck up the nutrients from the ground. And they're like, yeah, maybe they didn't understand all the biology <coughs> that we do now with, with more modern science, but they understood enough to know exactly that this, yeah, this is the case. And then there's one more soil, and some so, uh, fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Still nothing supernatural happened. If this is wheat that we're talking about, or if you even plant a tomato tree or, or any kind of tree that bears fruit, if you plant something, there's way more seeds in all of those fruits than the one little seed you planted. It, it grows a hundredfold. You know, one uh, apple tree could, could produce many more seeds for many more apple trees. And it's the same with just about every plant. You notice it can reproduce. Can we reproduce a hundredfold? Still nothing shocking. But if you heard this, would you have any idea what it meant? You could guess, but you'd have no idea that you were, you'd just be stabbing in the dark. Why did he say these things? You know, and the disciples asked the same thing. When his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he has an answer for them. And we're going to get there. But I want you to stay in that mode where you're, you're you know, you've studied this throughout the week if you came to the discipleship community. You've, you've heard other people's answers for it. But in, case, in terms of this sermon, try to put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. What does it mean? We know he has some kind of purpose behind it, some kind of meaning. What does it mean? Verse 9, when the disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but to others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now, if I asked you, I don't know what answer you might give, but I've been around church circles enough to know an answer. 
uh, to this question that sometimes people give. If I asked you, what's the purpose of parable, of parables? Sometimes the Sunday school answer to that is, well, he was uh, using metaphors and illustrations, kind of like I do, uh, maybe to somehow anchor a thought in a picture, in a word picture or illustration, or somehow deepen uh, our understanding about what something means by comparing something to something else that you know. You know this, so you compare this, like, it's like that, and it's like, oh yeah, okay, I get it. Was he doing that? Was he trying to make it easier for people to understand? That's an explanation I've heard for what Jesus' purpose was for the parables, but it's not his and his is a little bit shocking. Listen to this. To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. You say, well, why, why would he do that? Why would he speak in parables just so that some can't see and some can't understand? I don't understand. You're probably going to hate this answer, but the only answer I can give is the one that he does. It's so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. You think, well, that's so harsh. He only reveals the secrets to some and not to others. And I think that idea, I thought the very same thing, but I think actually the purpose of what Jesus is saying here is not for us to react and think, well, that's so harsh, but to think the exact opposite. When you know your biblical theology and when you're being honest with yourself, you know you do bad things. And you know you're not capable on your own of just starting to do all good things and never doing bad things. And according to the Bible, even just one bad thing leads to death. We're not just talking about biological death, we're talking about relationship to God, which sustains our eternal life or the possibility of our eternal life. And one bad thing interrupts our connection to the vine that allows us to reproduce spiritually, to have life everlasting and to share that life with other people. And so when you think about it, you know you don't deserve to know the secret of life. You didn't earn it. You didn't do something good enough to be like, now God owes it to you. So when you're beginning to realize, wow, I didn't, I'm not owed this knowledge. I'm not owed this revelation. I'm not owed to be spoken to plainly and clearly about this, which Jesus also does, by the way. But here we have this shocking purpose, and it is, it's offensive, honestly. Why would you hide it from some, I don't understand? Why wouldn't you just tell them the answer? Why wouldn't you just tell them the answer? Well, to diminish some of the shock and some of the reaction that could potentially happen here, it's not as though his explanation is currently hidden from people. Anybody in the world, if they can get their hands on a Bible, and it's more available than it's ever been in the history of the world, can read his explanation. They can read his explanation. But the fact of the matter is, even if they hear, he says, even if they see, they don't see, and they don't really hear, they don't really understand. So the unhiding of the secret is not just as simple as him explaining it. Have you ever tried to explain something spiritual to someone and you can tell the light's just not going? They can't understand. They don't hear it. They don't know. I would advise you not to put them in the category of people who will never be able to hear and never be able to see. Why would we do that? There was a time in my life where I didn't understand these things because I rejected them. I knew what was being said. I'm like, no, I don't agree. I don't believe that. And yet here I am preaching these very things in deep agreement and faith. And so in a straightforward way, I, when, when Jesus said something that I'm like, wait a minute, I like to reaffirm it. It's like, that's true. Sometimes affirmation of the truth precedes understanding. I know that's very backwards from what we, what we oftentimes learn is you gotta understand it before you can agree to it. What about if you just agreed to it before you understood it and then that un uh, unlocks your understanding? When you do, you can realize that faith is a gift. The ability to understand these spiritual words is a function of faith and it's not one we deserve. And so the attitude ought not to be, I understand the pain and the sadness of like, why would you not just reveal it to everyone? He doesn't. He has his purposes. He doesn't explain his purposes. But the fact that if you can understand this, there ought to be an overwhelming joy because without you deserving it and without me deserving it, he's revealed it to you. And it's the secret of life. If you can understand this, you have eternal life. That's unreal. That's unreal. 
If you're like me, even though I've studied this so many times, I just want to study it again and reaffirm myself that I get it because it means I have the gift of faith. God gave it to me, and I don't know why. I can't point to anything in myself. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. So let's see his explanation. So now, although he said this preamble about his purpose for parables, it's not just to make it easier to understand, but it's actually to hide it from some and to reveal it for others, and we don't understand why, and I'm not here to explain it to you because I don't have a biblical explanation, but I know that Jesus is good, and I know I'm overwhelmed with joy that I understand because that means he gave me the gift of faith to understand this secret. So here's the explanation that we've been waiting for, and here comes the revelation of the secret. Verse 11, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Okay, a seed's not just a seed. It's not about wheat. It's about the word of God. Imagine in your mind a picture of a seed representing God's word. Knowing that alone is a huge step in understanding the secret. Okay, so the farmer, you, I don't want to go too far with these parables. You don't want to stretch parables too far, but the, the farmer is God. The farmer is Jesus. Jesus is the one that's sowing here with his disciples, the gospel. The ones along the path of those who have heard so they actually heard the word of God. They, the seed was thrown at them kind of thing and thrown onto the, the soil that they represent. And then the devil comes and takes away the word of their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. You know, when we were studying this in the discipleship communities, or I don't know if it was before that or something, but the, someone expressed a little bit of surprise at the fact that, that the devil has that power, that he could just actually go and take that seed, that word of God, away from somebody. He does clearly, according to Jesus, and it's a terrible thing. And what's happened in this person's heart, it's, it's so hardened and so compact and so unreceptive to God's word that it just lays right there on the surface. It doesn't root. And when that happens, that is what gives the enemy the opportunity. You know, in another parable similar to this one in Matthew, Jesus says the, the birds are the demons, right? So Satan and all of those in his control, all the fallen angels come and just swoop up the seed, it's gone, and the path is barren and hard still. There's another soil here, and the soil is uh, the ones on the rock are those, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of testing, fall away. I've experienced this very thing in relationship to people that I've shared the gospel with, and it seems like it's taking root, and it seems like they're so excited, and so many changes are happening in their life, but then one thing happens. I remember one person found out that... Um, after having seemingly received the gospel and believed that uh, her parents uh, had to accept Jesus too or they wouldn't be saved. And that knowledge alone whew, was like all the, all the moisture went out of her faith and it was just gone. She couldn't accept the idea that if her parents, the fear of her parents not being with her in heaven just robbed her of the, the moisture that her faith needed to grow. It was very sad. Verse 13, and the ones, uh, excuse me, verse 14, as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. I want to spend the most time talking about and applying this one, because I think in a suburban context, it's the one that we're most at risk for. In an affluent, uh, this, a Tualatin church, and the surrounding areas might not be quite as wealthy as Lake Oswego or Westland, but we're relatively affluent and our neighborhood is relatively affluent, and um, you might not be in that category, but even if you're not in the affluent category of, of how we would define that in Tualatin, uh, the vast majority of Americans have way more than anyone else in the world does. There are people in the world that don't have a car, and we have three-car garages, you know, or we have access to cars. They don't even have access to cars even if you don't own one. And so if you're in that category, <coughs> Maybe the temptation for you is not necessarily the riches of life or the pleasures of life that you don't have access to, but maybe your category is the cares. Because if you don't have access to riches and pleasures that you can buy, trips, uh, there's still a lot of cares in your life. But this category of cares and riches and pleasures of life so easily begins to harm our faith to some degree in the suburbs. I can feel the pressure of, it's really enjoyable for me to uh, sort of build out my little kingdom around my house. 
to build a, a nice structure for my boys to be able to sleep in outside, to have my little planter box, to uh, plant my laurel head so I have privacy in the backyard, to have a little flagstone um, patio where I can have fire pit nights. All those things are, are great fun, and there's, there's nothing inherently evil about them, but if that's what life becomes about, which that's not what's life, what life is about. There's nothing inherently spiritual about those things either. And we know real life is found in the spiritual domain. Jesus is about to show us that in the last verse. But if your life becomes about food, and food is so good in Portland. There's so many restaurants, even now, that you can get amazing food. And, and if you're like me and you haven't been able to go to restaurants as much, you're finding ways to reproduce restaurant food. And you bought yourself a sous vide and you can make steak the exact way you want it, you know. The restaurant food, if you make it yourself as good as the restaurants, is cheaper than the restaurant food. So I can do it over and over again, and your heart can easily go after that delicious food. That's one of the temptations for me. It's one of the temptations for me. Maybe it's trips. Maybe it's having a better house. Maybe it's having a better job. Maybe it's just the cares. Maybe you're unhealthy. Maybe someone you love is unhealthy. These are the kinds of things that begin to choke faith. They begin to choke faith. Things, you know... I don't mean to talk down to anyone, but I watch the squirrels run around. They're freaking out because I put bark dust down and it covered their little nut. And their whole life exists just to find that next little nut. And when humans uh, devolve, so to speak, when they, when they become animalistic in their pursuits of cares and pleasures and riches of this life, we start beginning to lose the definition of what it really means to be a human being. That very next thing you can own, that's not the thing that's really going to give you life. It can be really fun. There might not be anything wrong with it. But if your life revolves and orbits around all of these things, Jesus is saying that's like having your soil be thorny. Those things can rob that nutrient-dense soil in which faith can grow, and they're dangerous, and, you, and we need to think about it. You need to think about it. I need to think about it. Is there conviction? Have you gone, at, you know, my, my phone uh, will tell me how many hours I spent on the phone on average each day. And it's way too much. I need to get rid of it. This is the cares and pleasures and entertainment and riches of life. It's way too much. It's nothing that has to do with the kingdom. It's just me entertaining myself on my phone. It bothers my wife. I don't think it has actually specifically started bothering my boys, but it will when they get older. Love is oftentimes expressed through attention. A phone can't experience love. My wife and those children can. I was convicted this week about that idea that one of the riches and pleasures of life that is like a thorn in my soil is my phone. I need to do something about that. But what about for you? So something you could highlight in your life, something that the Spirit is highlighting right now in your life that uh, is beginning to choke out your faith. If there is, just get rid of it. It doesn't lead to life. There's only one soil that leads to spiritually reproductive life. There's only one soil that leads to eternal life, and it's found in verse 15. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. You want your life to be spiritually reproductive and reproduce fruit a hundredfold? Fruit, uh, in, in the Greek word here can be also, uh, it's like a result or a product. Fruit is a metaphor. You want an amazing, hundredfold result and product to come out of your life spiritually? What is the secret to life? Where there are three words found in this verse and one word found in another verse. I'm going to reverse engineer the, verse, the word found in another verse. And it's, uh, it's one of the paths. I'm, I think it's on the path. No, it's receive it. There you go. Verse 13. And the ones on the rock are those who, when heard the word, they received it. But because of the heart soil that they have is all rocky, it can't grow. But receiving the word of God is important. Now let's look at the three words here in verse 15. It's they hear it, they hold it, and they bear it. But you got to hear it, receive it, hold it, and bear it. And that, friends, if you can understand what I mean by that, that's the secret of life. The secret of life is hearing, receiving, holding, and bearing the word of God. If you can understand what I mean by that, and I'm going to explain it as best I can and then close in prayer for you and for myself, then you have eternal life and then your life will be spiritually reproductive. It won't just be about that next thing you can get, that next food that you can taste, that next show that you can watch, that next friend that you can make, that next upgrade in people's view of you on social media that you can have. It won't be about just chasing things that are only earthly, but it'll be about having an a life that's lived for eternal gain and eternal impact. And it is about hearing, receiving, holding, 
and bearing the fruit of God. And when I say bearing, I don't mean, again, another synonym of holding it or even deeply in. I mean actually reproducing spiritually. Going and having a spiritually positive influence with the life that you've been given. So do you understand what he says here? Do you understand what he means? The seed's the word of God. You just heard the word of God. There are many people to whom this very parable and its explanation has been preached and they don't understand and they don't believe and they don't agree and it turns out that faith is a gift and if you understand what this is saying, that faith has been given to you. It's been given to you. If you've just been thinking about the earthly things in your life, maybe you're really down and disappointed and sort of dejected about your life because like, well, I'm not amounting to what I want to amount. Are all of your definitions of amounting to something in the earthly story? You wanted to have a better job. You wanted to have better clothes. You want a better car. You want to have better vacations. You just want to have a better life in general on earth. There's something so much more to life than that. And you might not be able to change your job and change your house and change your car and do all those things. But it's a promise. It is a promise that if you hear and receive and hold and bear God's word in your heart, your life will be spiritually reproductive. The things you do on earth will echo for an eternity. It's one of my favorite lines of one of my favorite movies in Gladiator. Things you do on earth will echo in eternity. It's only true if you can understand this. And it's an open secret. It's right here. All you need to do is believe it. All you need to do is believe it. Now, if you think about what the word of God actually says, you know, it's important to, if we say that hearing Receiving, holding, and bearing the word of God as the secret of life. What is the primary teaching of all of the Bible? It's that God loves you so much, he's willing to send his son to die for your sin. He sees we're not good. We don't deserve to have the secret open to us. We don't deserve that life. All of our choices left to our own devices are bent towards death. We do things that are deadly, you know? It's unbelievable. It's in me too. I eat a steak, you know what I want? Another steak. <laughs> it's not good for you. You feel so gut bombed if you eat two steaks. I won't tell you whether I do it or not, you know? It's definitely gluttony. It's sin. It's a, a disordered affection. It's a disordered desire, and it doesn't lead to life, and it's in us. It's in us. And God can actually, by his love and by his kindness and by his grace, before you even accept this teaching, prepare your heart to be a good soil. Help you to be honest about those things in your life that are disordered and have a good response to his word. I want you to consider if it's really rejecting the primary teaching of God's word, knowing all you have to accept is, yes, you're sinful, and you can't forgive yourself, and there's no one but God that can forgive you. And yes, Jesus died for all of that sin, past, present, and future, to forgive you for it. And if you believe that, and that although he loved you enough to die for your sin, he was too powerful to stay dead, and he was resurrected on the third day so that you can have hope of eternal life too, if you believe that, you will live forever, and your life will begin immediately to be spiritually reproductive, be spiritually reproductive here on earth. It's an amazing thing. And all I really have left to, to do for you is to pray that you would be able to hear, receive, hold, and bear God's word. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for revealing the secret of life to me. I didn't deserve it. I did almost everything a pastor's kid, a missionary kid, and a third culture kid could possibly do uh, to ruin my life to ruin my understanding, to darken my own perception, to plug up my ears to your gospel. So Lord, I just pray here at the end of this sermon that you would continually to till the soil of my heart to make it that good and honest soil. I pray that I would hear, receive, hold, and bear fruit with your word. And I pray the very same thing for anybody that ever watches this message and is watching right now. I pray that you would fill us with a unbelievable joy that we understand and I, help, I pray that you would help us to accept that we don't understand why you don't open the secret to everybody I don't find an explanation in scripture but I still believe you're good and I still believe you're loving because I've experienced myself and I want that for others I pray these things in Jesus name so I'm going to walk off camera for just a second to grab my communion elements 
And I'd like to take communion together. I'll lead us in communion. I'm going to read from Matthew 26, where Jesus instituted communion the first time. If you have your elements, all of what I'm doing right now is just filler for you to be able to go and get those elements and have communion together. The fact of the matter is, if you understand what communion means, you're saved. It means that Jesus shed his blood and allowed his body to be broken and died for your sin and was resurrected on the third day. And if you believe those things, you're saved and you have the secret of life living in you. We read in Matthew 26, towards the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, that he was having the Passover meal with his disciples. And knowing what he was about to have to go do, he gave the disciples a far deeper and far greater new covenant meaning to that Passover meal. And here's what he said. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. The body of Christ broken for you. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let's pray, and then we can continue in worship. Heavenly Father, I'm just filled with such joy that you have revealed the secret of life to me, to the people in this room, and to the many people that are watching this. I pray that you would open the eyes, unstop the ears, open the hearts, Lord, of the people that are listening to this. Till the soil of their heart. Amend it. Get rid of those undesirable affections that lead to things that are deadly. Let us focus not on the ways that we can reproduce on earth that have no consequence in eternity or only a negative one, Lord, but help us to focus and help us to reorder our desires to be spiritually spiritually reproductive here on earth. Lord, it It's a huge prayer, but I do ask that every single person that ever hears this sermon would understand the secret and by faith have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.